My name is Jace Collins. Dark Author 21 is my username on my Facebook business page where I advertise my work in horror fiction for adults. Mostly that is. <clears throat> Mostly that is. Anyway, in this video, I'm going to talk specifically about magical items. The summer weather is picking up here in the state of New Hampshire. We had a bit of a heat wave during this month for May. And as a result, the heat wave is going to come back at some point. I'm not sure when. If you hear a noise in the background, it's the air conditioner. I have a filter built into my phone. So you might hear some electronic noises in the background. Though, if you hear a certain type of an air vent noise, that's from the air conditioner that's nearby the living room. Anyway, to continue. There are a number of magical item categories or types that have been used in mythology for thousands of years. Specifically, within these categories, there are weapons types which are not as well-known in comparison to the staff and the sword. Well, the staff and the sword, by far, are very particular favorites. For example, the staff can also be called a stave when it's not being used in terms of a magic item, but rather as a weapon to fight with. In other cases, in Far Eastern cultures, it can be called a bow staff, even with a bamboo stick, which is also a part of samurai training. Let's see, what else specifically, in terms of items I'm thinking about? All right, so we have the weapons category, then there's the literature literature category, which is called Grimoire. That one's more common. Otherwise, if it's not called Grimoire, it's just called a spell book. I mean, spell books themselves have not only rituals, but also enchantment spells as well. So, any usual or regular spell can be an enchantment, because a ritual, require, a ritual requires more than a spell book in terms of magic, when you think about it. There's candles involved at times, but there's also certain types of ceremonial daggers, that's another way of looking at it. And depending on the, on the spell, there could be salt and water bowls, which are other types of magical items, to which at first were made out of either clay, as in they were ceramic, and in other cases were made from wood, before metal became a modern thing. Although, look at it this way, metal is really refined rock. That's what that is in terms of certain materials. It's refined rock. Technically speaking, even when a sword has been used to draw a magic circle, which is supposed to resemble the elements of fire and air when doing that, since it has refined material that comes from rock or earth, the sword itself when it's used as a magic item, to which at times it has been, also the axe, should have more so some resemblance in some cases to the earth or rock elements. When it comes to mythology and knowing specifically what's, what origin stories in terms of magical items have started and in terms of their uses, it can be kind of complicated. Mythology has a very specific tricky pattern, especially when it comes to magical items more than any other type of mythology there is. And other types, for example, granted a shrine can be considered a magical item, but it's far more of a, a generator in some ways. Just as the magic staff is not the same magical item as a wand. If anything, a magic staff is more like a generator of power and can be used as a monolith. Whereas a monolith is a type of tool that either comes from a staff or is something that's far more colossal to open a portal between either dimensions or realms. So it all depends on the type of mythology specifically, and also depends on the origin story. 
because there are multiple types of monoliths throughout mythology in different parts of the world throughout many cultures. And monolith stories are rare stories in particular. The trickiest part about being an American when it comes to the U.S. is that there's not as much known about certain cultures, especially certain types of mythology, especially far more so in the Eastern Hemisphere when you go more far east and down in the southern area of the Far East in comparison. Now, I have done research on magical items, though I also know specifically how some magical items have been reincorporated into everyday life. I'm going to give you two very specific examples as to how it's happened. I'll start with an easy one, knives. Very specifically, chef's knives and butter knives. When it comes to knives themselves, whenever you see a chef's knife that at times has a black handle, that by origin refers to a knife that was originally a ceremonial knife that's been used in grim war, as in dark rituals. So any type of a knife that was ever used for, for black magic, whether by a, a warlock or a dark witch, was often used in blood magic or blood rituals. And in some cases, depending on the ritual, can also be considered a ceremony. A ceremony, when it comes to magic, is a very specialized ritual. And there are a number of different types of ceremonies in the original Grim Wars that have been used in different categories. For example, there's ascension ceremonies where someone has achieved a new rank in a certain type of occult when being a part of a magic group or a magic tribe, including ceremonies for leaders to take on the mantle for a group. There have been ceremonies for that, just as there have been ceremonies specifically for summoning demons or celebrating demons, even with ritual sacrifices to appease demons. But also not just demons, dark gods in many particular religions throughout thousands of years. So, quite often, a knife, whether small or large, that's ever had a black handle, has always been used for some type of ritual, specifically a ceremony involving blood magic. Whereas a white witch's knife was often much smaller, about the size of a butter knife, and was used for more pure purposes. Now, here's the difference but specifically between the handles of the black witch's knife versus the white witch's knife. And even then, all knives have been associated with witchcraft, so that's why, by reference, they're called witch's knives. The black witch's knife came from certain types of blackwood trees, and there are several types in certain parts of the world. So any type of blackwood, or as it's also called ashwood, was used to make the handle. Now, when it comes to white trees specifically, according to mythology, there were some types of trees in particular, certain types of white ash trees that are the opposite, but still in the same family as the black ash or black wood that we used to make the white witch's handles. Now, do I believe that these trees have been around before? Well, look at it this way. There was a time that certain trees a long time ago, during the times of the prehistoric involving giant bronchiosaurus dinosaurs were eating certain types of leaves from trees that no longer exist in today's time. So I do believe it is possible that there were white ash trees a long time ago and that for some reason, whether they've been be forced to do the logging or if they were ever simply burnt away during some kind of a fire issue by nature, that it could have just happened. They could have all been gone by a natural fire or they could have all been for forested down. They could have all been logged away. A long time ago and no one even know about it. That's my belief on that. However, it was believed according to certain very rare stories that this type of white wood was used for making white witches knives and they were used for very specific types of rituals. Although not as much involving blood magic, more so involving chopping up certain types of materials that by far could be used for either healing treatments or could be used 
for other types of purposes. If anything, the White Witch's Knife was used as more of a, in some cases, as a healing tool, even for certain types of magical remedies for the body. And over time, these types of knives were reworked into everyday life. For example, whenever you would normally see a black handle on a sharp knife, even for a small steak knife, that's been the resemblance of, yes, as I've said before, the dark witch's knife. But if you've ever seen like a butter knife, like from the time of the early 1900s that had like a, a certain type of metal white handle or even a plastic white handle to a butter knife, that's from the resemblance of the look of the white witch's knife. And another name for a white witch's knife is called an ethane. Whereas with the black witch's knife, that's the dark ethane. Ethane spelled A-T-H-A-N-E. And the word ethane comes from the lost English, the very first English that not even the modern day British culture even uses anymore. And the thing is that when it comes to the very old fashioned English, depending on some of the old fashioned journals you would read in English, the very first forms of, of writing English, you might find certain ways of how words were spelt a long time ago that no longer anybody uses anymore. Now, as for me, I, I only know that one word spelt that way, although I do know that when it comes to fishing journals, because I've done some research on the history of fishing, and I learned that there were certain words that were spelt in, in certain ways. And some of my videos, what I would like to do is I would like to talk more about history specifically I would like to make some videos explaining some of the things that I've learned about history. One of them could be some of the spelling to certain types of titles and names from fishing journals. On the Britannica.com website, which is the British World Reference books, like before textbooks, for example, there were World Reference books, and now those are online involving Britannica.com, AtlasObscura.com, the Atlas Obscura being Greek. I gathered some history information from that. I do read history and mythology to help me improve upon my horror fiction at times. It's very useful. So as I'm saying another video, I could spend my time speaking about some of the information I found and show some of the spelling to, towards some of the words from the original English. Though it'll be very little. I only have very little information about the original English and how it was first spelled with certain words. It's very difficult for me to find information like that, even if it's online and credible. just as it was very difficult for me to find information about the lost magical items. And even then, the information I know about them also exceeds some of the information I have found from a book that I had discovered when I was 18. All right, so now for the other examples. When we look at Axe culture specifically, I did some research on Axe culture from the Swedish National website. Even though the information by majority I found is more historical, for example, there were axes that had been around for millions of years ago, ever since the old Stone Age. Though, I remember from a PBS documentary I once saw back when I was a teenager in the early 2000s, as in even before the year 2010, there was this documentary that had shown that the Copper Age for axes was in between the, the, the earliest Stone Age versus the later Stone Age. And how it was found out was that there was this particular person, either a traveler or a hiker, that went up a certain mountain and ended up dying on on a a, uh, a singular expedition or a singular journey. And what was found was a copper hatchet. So the Copper Age had happened in between the early and late Stone Ages. And then afterwards, the when the copper was found out about, and then in turn it was mixed with tin to make bronze. That's when the Bronze Age began. And I'm not really sure specifically if bronze axes or even if copper axes were used for the for the original forms of Grimoire. However, I do know this. I know the axe culture between Greek culture and Roman culture specifically was used for some very particular types of ceremonies. 
However, it's more so that during the, the Iron Age that certain axes were made for throwing, as in throwing weapons. And even during one particular invasion amongst the Italians, the Frankish tried to invade them with throwing axes, but the only difference is that the Frankish relied too much on axes in comparison to having other weapons with them to win a certain battle. And not only that, considering the empire that the Frankish were trying to invade during their time was not very smart in terms of not having other weapons with them. It, it just didn't help. They weren't as strategic. However, even at medieval fairs in modern times, there are people that still recreate the same methods for the, the Frankish throwing knives and use them at certain small game stands at any particular Renaissance fair or medieval fair, even in the U.S. So that's an important thing to remember about history itself. Specifically, even in Greek culture, it's a very big, big mistake to think that all Greeks were smart, just as it's a big mistake to think that all Romans were smart. There were different times between certain points of the time, between the Greek, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, specifically in terms of those that were smart versus those that were barbaric. And some of the most barbaric times in Greek culture were Axe culture. And one of the ways to know this is that during a certain time in the ancient Greeks, there was a place that was literally called the City of Axes, where blood sacrifice and even certain types of paintings that were shown on certain parts of different walls in certain areas where these rituals took place showed very specific ways that people used the axes in rituals specifically. So in other words, the idea of hieroglyph or picture making on walls was a thing well before ancient Egyptian culture. That was a thing even during the times of the Greeks involving their barbaric culture from a long time ago. So very specifically in axe culture, I have found from my research that axes themselves have been a very important part of culture and that the axe itself originally, yes, has been used as both a tool and a weapon, even well before the sword during the Stone Ages, though the very first axes were more like jagged rocks. They weren't exactly the kinds that had like the blade type until after when metal was taken from rocks and refined to make the wooden part of the axe with the, the metal head to the axe part. And that's the true difference between the old-fashioned axe versus the, the more modern way of making an axe. So even when the axe was modernizing, it was only made as a hatchet at first. It wasn't made as a long axe. It was a small version of an axe. And that's why I believe that these first small axes have been used in the first Grim Wars. However, there's no way to say for certain, there's no way to officially prove in any documentation of any particular archive whatsoever or any other record, no matter if it's from mythology itself or history, wherever it is in any part of the world, and that's by official public access, that is, that would ever say for certain if a copper hatchet was ever truly used in original Grim War. But if it were... I'd find it to be very fascinating. As far as salt and water bowls go, even when those were used for, for magic itself, depending on certain types of, of magic, a salt or water bowl could be used for white magic or dark magic. Those were flexible magical items back then. And the salt and water bowl later on became used as mixing bowls even by metal at different shapes and sizes. Normally, mixing, normally before mixing bowl, a salt and water bowl would be made in very specific sizes. And you could tell from the sizes the difference between a bowl that was used for water versus a bowl that was used for salt. And obviously the salt bowl was smaller than the water bowl. Anyway, to continue, the next type of magical item specific I want to talk about has to do with the chalice versus the scale. And this is a part of how Egyptian culture comes into a very big part of how this has revolutionized to British culture and to gems. So to explain this, the chalice specifically, in some ways, looks similar to a goblet. The chalice itself, in some cases, has also been, has also been a substitute to a cauldron. 
Aside from using small cauldrons or even bigger cauldrons that have used, been used for hot pot cooking and kettle cooking, a chalice in many cases was either used as a substitute, as a substitute or, in, or in combination with a cauldron. And there's a reason for this. It's because in contrary to what you've seen in Hollywood movies and cartoons at times, a wooden ladle or a metal ladle was not very ideal when using that for the process of making potions because with the ladle, you can spill accidentally fluids from it. And as it would show by an implied theory, the implied theory is that no particular witch, no matter what the witch, ever preferred to use a ladle because of the chances of spilling a potion and in turn the potion being wasted. That's the implied theory of that anyway. As far as chalices go, a chalice is a type of drinking glass for potions that originally was made from either silver or gold. And not only that, there were very specific gems that were encrusted or rather socketed into the chalice. And they were very specifically designed by certain cuts of gems, but also the overall sizes. And these particular types of, types of combinations, though especially the very specific shapes, for chalices represented certain types of occults or very specific families that used them over so many years. So whenever you see a chalice in particular, what that means is the significance of it comes from a magic family. However, because there were certain occults that kept their particular family, family lives secret, not just with much of their scholar information at first, though also with especially their ways of magic, trying to keep those secrets from the public, to keep others from gaining true magic power, it's very hard to tell where so many chalices first came from in certain families, from the gold to the silver. So as a result, it does get difficult to tell. However, there are two common constants with this, that any types of black stones or any amethyst stones specifically, when used for dark magic, were very distinctively used in a number of chalices. As far as dark stones go, black opals, also onyx gems, and I'm not really sure about pewter specifically, but even that could have been used, and perhaps even obsidian. Though an amethyst stone and, and black opals were commonly used in, cha in chalices. Now, over time, by the time when the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptian times had started, the chalice was taken from being this type of drinking glass that was used in potion substitution or potion, or potion assist when having a type of glass that could very efficiently scoop up any type of a cauldron, cauldron fluid without spilling it so easily onto a floor or onto a table. And you could hold the chalice over a cauldron and drink from it thing about that is that the following, the second generation chalice was a scale. Yeah, legit a scale. And the very first scale was only made with two sides. And it had only one stand specifically. To which many scales themselves are commonly by one stand in comparison to being multiple. So that's how the, the scale itself has been originally. And these scales were used in terms of weighing, well, <laughs> as crazy as this will sound. In contrary to the, mummy, to the mummy movies you have seen in Universal Studios with one of the star actors being Brandon Fraser. Granted, mummification has been, in terms of mythology, the way to bring the dead back to life, but there are two things about that you wouldn't normally know. One of them was the possibility of ascending to becoming a god. And that's what the process of mummification was for. It was believed to be one of multiple methods to do that in Egyptian culture. However, much of Egyptian mythology was burnt away during the Theban King Wars. And there were supposedly over a dozen other methods aside from mummification to do this. Now, during the Theban King Wars, there were hostile takeovers of Egypt to rule the throne. 
And as a result of this, there were even libraries that were burnt away. So as a result, you know, a lot of lost mythology, not enough known stories about ascending to becoming a god, ancient Egyptian culture, that became a major problem. And after when the Theban King Wars were at an end, the capital of Egypt had changed from Thebes to Cairo. Now the reason why I know this is because of a source on the Egyptian national, the Egyptian national website that says so. When you're looking at Egyptian mythology and you look at the national website for that, you'll see that. Though supposedly there were even elementals in Egyptian mythology that ascended in their own ways to becoming gods and goddesses. So yeah, there were some goddesses in Egyptian mythology that, that unfortunately don't really have as many well-known stories as to how that had happened. Now specifically with the scale, there is a poem where the reference having a heavy heart comes from. And the story of the poem goes that there was a man looking at his heart and seven other hearts on eight scales when being judged for having a heavy heart. And if you've ever seen the Supernatural TV series, there's an episode where Osiris is judging one of the Winchester brothers, and this is a part of where this poem comes into play as an original reference for being judged for a heavy heart. While admittingly that episode was nowhere near the same as the original poem, it does not change the true origin of where having a heavy heart comes from. And this is a part of the scales culture, or the, the first Egyptian chalice part of the culture had come from. So after when the man's heart that was taken out of his chest at the time was weighed to be the heaviest, he was judged and found guilty for having the heaviest heart on the scales. And in the scales of Egyptian culture, when weighing hearts but also other organs, this was the way of deeming who was the most guilty to be sent to hell versus who was deemed worthy to rise. This was a large part of the world's connected to mummification back during those times. And as a matter of fact, even when in Egyptian culture that people would show their respect, they would always lead with their left foot forward because with a person's heart is closest to the left side of their chest versus their right, which is another part of Egyptian culture. Also the saying, leading with your best foot forward or putting your best foot forward, that's from the left involving Egyptian culture, the left foot, in the closest direction of your heart. Yeah, so a lot of culture about that. Getting a little dehydrated here. Yeah, the, the heat's not too bad right now. I mean, it's not like it's 80 or 90 degrees out, but even still. Thankfully, the air conditioner's been going for, I'm not even sure how long. So it helps. Anyway, to continue. Now, over time, there were three very specific scales that were added to the, the original stand, the base stand of of the chalice. However, the chalice itself became repurposed as a scale for weighing, guess what? Gold, silver, and copper, which was weighed as what? Pounds. And pounds in culture of Europe were what? The first currency. Yeah, the first currency. Royalty in British culture, even kings, used to weigh out their gold, silver, and copper by the use of remodeling the original Egyptian chalice. And then over time, what happened was as British royalty started to realize that they had too much gold, silver, and copper to count, what happened? The first banks were made, which were used to count gold, silver, and copper. And once it was found that many people could count all this money, that was when eventually, when people that were considered lowborns were allowed to make an income. That was how banking and currency became a thing. And then after when there was a need for having paper to pay for things in terms of currency, those became the first banknotes. So the establishment of pounds and notes, British culture. 
and that's how those particular items are reworked into everyday life. So several forms of magical items have been reformed in everyday life. Even in modern times, there are some people that use axes when logging out in nearby woods. As a matter of fact, I live in the state of New Hampshire in an area where there's tons of woodlands and there are people that all the time either log or chainsaw down paths. I mean, not so much for burning the wood for campfires, though more so for riding their motocross stuff, their dirt bikes and their ATVs throughout the woods. But my point is, is that there are many magical items that have been evolved over time and reincorporated into everyday life, even in the U.S. And I know those origins. I traced every one of them, all of them. And that's how I know. All right, let's, that concludes this video. I may make a part two of what I'm talking about later. I'll think about it. All right, well, until next time.